You're listening to The View From Up Here, an equipping podcast by Viewpoint Leadership and Development. Our vision is to cultivate a change in the way the world views leadership and development. And our mission is to foster better leaders through a modern approach while developing individuals into their true selves. My name's Brad Walbridge, your host for our time together. And joining me in our conversations is our president and founder, Josh Trout, and our COO, Joel Archery. Want to welcome in our viewers watching the View From Up Here podcast. Brad Walbridge here with Joel Archery. Good to have you, Joel. It's a pleasure. I don't know why I did the Nixon. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Good Nixon. Two fingers there. You know, I, I think um, it, this is exciting that we're not only doing this for you know people to be able to carry audio-wise, right. but the idea that we could be, even though we're not interacting with them directly, there is something about just that presence piece yeah. where they feel like they're in, in the conversation with us. And they get to see us react when we're talking. And right. They, yeah, it endears right, us right. differently. Right, because we're, I mean, for those that may not know this, we're, we're not rehearsing any of this. Mm-mm. We know roughly what we want to talk about, but we really want it to be a conversation right. that we invite people into. Exactly. So, uh, And one of the things is we're, is we're getting the podcast started, uh, and we're starting to, to share with people what Viewpoint is and what this podcast, The View From Up Here, is. Um, I really thought it'd be helpful for, for you and for Josh to be able to share a little bit about yourselves, for yeah. people to, to get to know you a little bit, get to understand uh, your passion behind yeah. what we're doing. Um, and I thought we, we just create some space to be able to do that. So I know people have probably heard uh, our other episodes of the podcast, uh, but kind of share how you got connected in to Viewpoint and, and the podcast kind of culminating yeah. into what it is. Yeah, so so you know, being a young person growing up in the church, my dad was a pastor, and so I had a lot of exposure to all different kinds of leaders, all different kinds of leaders from different points of view and contexts, and uh, even just kind of myself and my personality. Uh, I was someone who was always an observant person, so I was observing people around me and uh, selfishly observing my brother and my sister and the negative things they'd do and how they would get punished mm-hmm. and how to avoid those things to walk through life as as perfectly as possible on the outside, Sure, uh, but very, uh, very cognizant of what was wrong on the inside of me. And so yeah. I always had that tension within me of feeling the frustration of the things that I was doing secretly, feeling the success of doing things perfectly on the outside and manipulating the system, playing the game, as you could say. And so I really learned early on how people play the game and how they can kind of do things to make things happen when really there's a lot going on behind the scenes that's not great. And there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of frustration, whether it's personally caused by themselves or as a result of other people, but they still play the game. And so growing up in the church in that way, I I could see the pain from other people. You'd hear conversations as you do as a a PK from your parents (coughs) talking about people in in the church and hearing about what they're going through. And so you're very aware that there is present pain oftentimes driving people uh, mixed with dreams and passions. And there's this interesting mix between the two uh, that, that kind of really pushes people in what they're doing. So that kind of started this, I didn't even know it, but it started this idea of mantra. And I know we've talked about it in a couple of podcasts before, but this idea of there's, there's some type of gravitational force outside of your relationship with the Lord or lack thereof pushing and, and determining the things, <coughs> the things that you're doing, right? And so uh, that was something I was cognizant of when I was younger. And then as I've gotten older and started to see the world as from a perspective of ministry as well as being a pastor at one point, and then now in the corporate world, you you see that more clearly, right? You start to see uh, as what we would call it heat in the, in the life of people. Uh, so the heat that pulls things out of people that when you're exposed to it, it it pulls out the good and the bad. And so right. and, and, and a lot of people, right, you, the heat is the stress and the pressure of work. Or in the pastor, it's the stress and pressure, pressure of shepherding people. Yeah, sure. And you would see these things from different leaders, and I would see it from different leaders, and I was very acutely aware of, okay, I don't, I don't like that, I don't, and I don't know why I don't like it, but I just don't think it's working out in the sphere of that influence, right? And I started to really look into that. And so as I started to think more about the sphere of the influence of the, that you have when you're a leader and why are these people put in these positions as leaders if they don't use their sphere well? And, sure. and, and so I would feel this tension that was kind of rising up within me of, okay, this just doesn't feel right. And so when Josh and I were, were talking, because Josh and I started talking about it because Joanna, my wife, was editing his web, creating this website technically for Viewpoint and the View From Up Here podcast. 
And that's how we kind of started to talk more about leadership because we just sit uh, with a cigar and a, and a glass of whiskey and we'd talk about leadership. And I, he'd let me vent and <laughs> all my frustrations and he would field them with his grace and kindness that he always does. And then he started to see, hey, I think you have a really good perspective about leadership that aligns with mine. Let's, let's talk about partnering. And then that's kind of how Viewpoint got its start. And then this podcast, you know, The View From Up Here, we, we really believe that we want to create a space that is a safe space without being cliche for people and leaders to have uh, maybe people that root for them, that they, they don't really know personally, sure. but people like Josh and myself and even you that are rooting for leaders to be better leaders. And we're not just condemning them. We know what it's like. We know what you're going through. You have people that are empathetic, not just sympathetic for you. Uh, and we want you to be successful. And not just the, the leading for the sake of the benefit of the marketplace. Right, exactly. But for the benefit of actually caring for and growing better people. Exactly. You know, and, and in so doing for us as leaders that we would become better people as yeah. we, as we do that, you know, so, so many good conversations seem to come from a good cigar and a Amen. good Amen. glass of whiskey. Amen. You know, and, I love them. and you guys, as you're talking, you just, th- those ideas just kind of come out of that and spring into, you know, what we're, what we're working with today. Exactly. So what do you see as um, just kind of your role and your vision for your role yeah. uh, as part of Viewpoint? Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting question to ask because when I was younger, you know, you're in the church, you're young, I was a tall person, I was extroverted, and so people were always like, you're going to be a leader, yeah. and you have this hubris about you now, and they're like, I'm going to be a leader, I'm oh, going to make an yeah. impact, and then nothing yeah. happens. Or, or you, you do terrible things with your life like I did, and you like undercut a lot of the stuff that you could do. Uh, but I was always wanting to be a leader, and I felt like I could be a leader. And what what was wonderful about my kind of schooling and the, the, my experience is uh, I really cut my teeth, all that observation that I was doing younger in master's in counseling and psychology undergrads and all that stuff, and then just kind of getting into pastoral counseling, working one-on-one with people, figuring how to best work with people. So what was originally used to manipulate people and to get what I wanted out of situations because I would literally test hypothesis about people like, okay, if I say this to this person, what do they do? They do this. Okay, let me test that with someone else. And it became this like figuring people out. Yes, I know that's terrible. I acknowledge that it was stupid. It was sinful. Should not have done it. But here's the cool thing. Nowadays, right, what I'm, this whole mantra thing, I can sit down like I did literally yesterday. I did a fishbowl live session, which is kind of like an online TED talk via phone. And you call in, you listen to someone talk about a topic. And I was talking about conquering interview anxiety and finding your mantra. And 1,700 people listened. And I did a live mantra session with like six people. And what they would do is I would ask them, I'd just say, hey, Brad, tell me what drives you. I want you to think about it, though. Give you a minute. Tell me what drives you. What's motivating everything you do? Mm. And then you just list off things. And some people give you a lot, which is just like counseling. Sometimes you get a lot from your people you're counseling, and it's great. And it's really easy to get you know, where they need to go, figure things out. Or sometimes you're doing counseling, and they go, no, I'm, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm good. And you're just like, okay, uh, how was your day? It was, it was fine. Very and, simple. Right. And so you learn to pull as much as you can out of anything, right? right. Like r- milk and an almond, basically. I don't know why I said that, but let's, let's stay there. But you, you do with what you, 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 you basically get what you get and you don't pitch a fit, as my wife would say. And I would sit on this Fishbowl Live session and I would say, okay, here's what I'm thinking your mantra is. And your mantra is typically this little script of, I am someone who... You do a statement, and then you say, in that, and then you explain that statement. Uh, and so I did that with a bunch of these people, and I was able to basically write on the money, say what their mantra is, and they were like, that's perfect. That's incredible. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things I, I add value-wise to Viewpoint is there's really no one else in the game right now able to sit down with someone, anyone. I could sit down with everyone in this room in the studio, and I could say, let's find your mantra. And I could do it in 15 minutes, like in less than that to give you a general ballpark, but 15 to 30 minutes to then connect it to resume, job description, things that you're doing in life, what you're doing right now. Uh, And so I think that's the big value add that I bring to Viewpoint is that perspective. Well, I I would imagine that in that process, even for yourself, one of the struggles would be because it's it's not where we're bent as a culture. Right. One of the struggles would be the degree of honesty that you need to have with yourself. Mm to even arrive at that mantra. Can you speak to what that was like for yourself? Yeah. And what that's like helping others navigate the, yeah. the honesty factor in that. Yeah, it's it's interesting because when you when you look at a mantra, so let's say contextually, when I'm helping someone with a mantra, 
as far as an interview is concerned, right? There's a whole, there's a whole interplay. There's a whole game, right? I told you guys, I'm, I'm really about figuring out how to play the games in different places. And there's a whole game in interviewing, right? The interviewer really is there to be sold on who you are. And so you need to be ambiguous enough about your mantra that they want to identify with it and when it's positive. So if I were to say like mine is, uh, I want to be a refreshment. I'm someone who loves to be and finds joy from being a refreshment to every single person and every single interaction I have with them. In that, I want to be someone who builds others rather than burdens them. I want to be someone who edifies rather than drains them, right? Mm -hmm. No matter what, if I'm leading a team or just talk, a passerby mm -hmm. on the street. And that is something that most people, I think, would want to identify with, right? It's, it's, it's specific enough to me because I know it. That's exactly deep down who I am. But I could, listen, I could say that to someone else and be like, well, I don't not want to be that, right? No person is right. going to say that. Wouldn't, I don't want to do that. Sure. And so it's general enough or vague enough to, where people can identify with it and almost kind of insert worth, their own worth into that and say, like, that's something I would want. But it's specific enough to you that is, is honest enough about really what, at the end of the day, what gives you joy, and then you just talk about it in a certain way. So it can, get, it can get more specific if it really wants to be something personal. But if you're telling other people, it can get generic enough to where other people could identify with it and kind of insert themselves. What do you feel like the struggle is for most people? As you in, have engaged people in Fishbowl and even just doing it one-on-one, -on -one, right. what do you feel like the struggle for most people is in that process? Where do they get hung up the most? Yeah. So for some people, some people spend more time thinking about like what's driving them. Right? They might be in a season where they have to. But more often than not, most people don't think about that. They don't think what's currently driving everything I do right now or everything I'm thinking. So it, it is usually like either at the onset, right, at that first question, hey, what's driving you? And they're going, I don't know, the bills I have to pay. Uh, and then what I have to try to do is kind of get some more out. So I think at one point I said on, the, on this podcast, I had someone say, oh, I don't want to have to think about stuff that I'm buying. I don't want to have to think about the price tag. I'm yeah. like, okay, that's great. Candid answer. Sure. Let's see if we can get a little bit more professional, right? And so getting more from her and what she was saying, kind of, oh, she likes being able to do stuff outside of work. She likes a good work-life balance. She likes having the money to do things she enjoys. Okay, okay. And then you start to get to a point and then you find the mantra. It's like, hey, you like when work works for you, mm -hmm. right? In that, and then you fill in the blank. And so, so for some people, it is just what's the first kind of visceral reaction to it? It's usually typically ha something having to do with material. Something having to do with just what's their, what they're having to spend money on, stuff in their life, immediately right in front of them. Not deep down, kind of superficial. And then there are some people who give really great first answers because they are people who are either just more generally introspective right. or in the season they're in, they've had to think about it. So a lot mm -hmm. of people in job hunting are having to think about what's driving them because they're like, I'm looking for a job and I'm trying to find this job. And so they're currently in that mindset. So. Yeah. And they've been beating their head against the wall yes. enough. Yes that they've had to work through a lot of language and yeah. understanding of And my heart goes out to those people a lot. So on my Fishbowl Live session, I had a lot, I had one guy come up and ask a question. He was like, I, have get, I get in all these interviews and I get rejected and I'm on a contract right now and it's about to end and I don't know what's going to happen. And I am yeah. just frustrated and I don't know if it's me. Like, is it me? Is it, am I just not what anyone wants? And I, my heart goes out to those people and I... I really try in those moments, especially on that call, to be really empathetic and say, I hate that for you. And I know it's super frustrating. And I, I don't know if this mantra thing is going to fix everything for you, but I think it's worth a shot. And I'd be happy to sit down with you. And I, and I just try to give people hope, which I think mantra at its, in its core is about giving you hope about what you and yourself can accomplish. Well, I, there's such value in being able to put language, yes, put yeah. words to not just not just an employment situation, right? but look at, I mean, for us as married men, I mean, yeah. think about when suddenly you and your wife have language that's common with yes. each other and, and what that creates, the intimacy that that creates, the communication, um, the strategy, the teamwork that that creates yeah. uh, with, a, with a team at work. When you, when you have that language that you all are rallying around, uh, it's powerful. Yeah. It's yeah. absolutely powerful. For you... Um, as you've engaged with people in mantra sessions, whether it be fishbowl, whether it be you know in person, where do you feel like people connect with your story specifically? Maybe not all the parts of right. it, but but enough of it. Where do you feel like people draw this connection from you personally, and yeah. and and get that refreshment that you are that you're talking about? Yeah, everyone wants to know that they have someone on their side. Like someone's rooting for them. Yeah. Everyone wants to know. And that's why I think a lot of people, uh, I mean, as, as someone who used to do marriage counseling, one of, the, one of the, the main issues you'd find is they're no longer rooting for each other. 
they're at odds. Mm, and that ca- that yeah. causes a lot of tension, right? And so yeah. Yeah, you know too, because you've done counseling with, with married couples too. You see that. You're like, you guys are no longer partners supporting each other. They're, you're at odds. And so you both don't feel like the other per- person's rooting for you. Right. And that's what makes a really healthy marriage even healthier is when you know the other person's rooting for you. And it makes a uh, marriage unhealthy when you don't feel like the other person's rooting for you. Right. And so every person, whether they're married or unmarried, on the street wants to know someone's in their corner. Yeah. And I think a big part of that when I talk to people is they see I don't have an ulterior motive other than I just want to refresh them and I want them to know that someone's rooting for them. Want want them to see that there is an element of themselves that they may not know about. I want to unlock that and I want to help them go into the future of whatever their opportunity is. Uh, and there, people see that it's amicable. It's altruistic. There's no, hey, look at me. Can you write a recommendation on LinkedIn? It's no, I, I really at the, at, at the end of the day, at my core, want someone to be refreshed and have a better perspective about themselves. Yeah. When you think back over your your story, you know, b- before what you're doing now, before Viewpoint, before yeah. the podcast, anything, if, if you were to take your mantra and you were to rewind oh. 15, 20 years in your life, e- even, even let's just say 10 years yeah. in your life, and you were to take mantra back to... The, the difficulty and the challenges mm. that, that you experience that have left scars on you. Yeah. What, what would look different? Yeah, you know, it's, we were talking about this before the podcast. When I was younger, old enough to remember, not old enough to really understand gravity, I had blood poisoning in my left arm, and I had no, no idea where it came from. Mm. And my parents had no idea either. And uh, it, it, you, you, it, literally, you could see it going up a vein, and it was this dark kind of like trail and they would mark it with a sharpie every day really as it would kind of make its way and i i'm not old enough to know like hey i could die yeah i'm just like it's i know there's some dread i should feel yes it's it's creeping towards something but mom and dad are coloring on my arm (laughs) yeah and i'm like it's past the sharpie mom uh and then they would they prayed and eventually went away but it's it's something that stuck with me as far as an image right because as as i did stuff when i was younger I put myself in positions that now have led to me wrestling with things like anxiety and depression, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, I think of it a lot like that, that poison in my blood that's making its way to, towards my heart. And I'm always, I always have the propensity for that to happen as far as anxiety or depression or, or stressors to do that. And I, if, I've thought about this actually a lot. As I've done mantra stuff, I'm like, man, if only I had had a better sense of myself back then, uh, I would have understood, one, the tensions that I was feeling like when you're butting up against something, why am I frustrated? Mm. And then I would have known, well, the reason why I'm frustrated is I'm, there's something who I am that's not really working here. And then also why I was turning towards the wrong things, right? And one of those things was I wanted to be wanted. And so I would put myself in positions that weren't good. And I, by, with people that would say, say they wanted me or I would make and manipulate a situation to be with someone and show like, oh yeah, I'm wanted. Right, and that was me wanting to be a refreshment for someone to see value in the relationship between me and my and themselves, and go like, I really appreciate you being in my life. Yeah, you're a refreshment, right? Yeah, I didn't get that because I didn't know that. I was like, I just need you to want me in some way and feel like this was reciprocal. Yeah, right. It wasn't just me, and I I know that if I had known this about myself earlier on, I could have I would have had like you said language. I would have had handles to kind of look at my life differently, and I think I would have chosen better paths as, as a result. Yeah. I want you to speak to the leader that's listening, whether they're a leader that's just starting out right, or a leader that has been struggling to, to really find their path, their yeah. language of how they lead, why they lead, what they're doing. Maybe even the, the guy that's, that's in the contract mm. and doesn't know what he's going to do next. Yeah. What would you say to anybody listening that is that is new in one of those roles or is earlier struggling uh, about uh, how to move forward. Yeah, I would say that nothing is more urgent than knowing yourself better before you make a move, mm-hmm. right? So a lot of people with business think, and I mean, I know this, I work for Cisco. I work for this company that has 77,000 employees, multi-billion dollar company, right? Everything's a fire drill, everything's urgent, everything's mm-hmm. business critical. Uh, and what I feel like we miss a lot in any company is you put results before people, even though you say you put people, you don't understand that the most urgent thing is to have the right people in the right spot under understanding themselves rightly. And then the business will take care of itself. And so I would say for you, no matter what season of life you are, as far as leadership goes, be more urgent about knowing yourself as best as possible 
And then I think you'll be able to make the best decisions about where you need to go, what path, how to lead better in the moment. And then, then take what you know and apply that to the business that you're a part of or the position that you're a part of or the position that you're looking at. Yeah. And I think that's what I would always say. Nothing is more urgent than knowing yourself as best as possible before you make a next move. If our listeners want to connect with you, want to talk through this more, want to even set up a mantra session, um, what, what would their next steps be? Well, we have the website, right? right. So view, the, the viewpointco.com, uh, there is a contact page. And on the contact page, there are services that you're interested in. Right. And one of those is mantra sessions. Then you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I take messages all the time on LinkedIn. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Hey, I'd like to, like, I'd like to book a, a mantra session. Uh, and then I always, like, one of the things, because I feel like this is important and I don't just want to put it behind a paywall, I like to do these fishbowl live sessions. And anyone who goes to them, I say, hey, if you attend this fishbowl live session, you get a free mantra session. Yeah. You just let me know you went to the fishbowl live thing, ping me and say that, and then we'll, we'll connect and we'll do a free mantra session. But usually it's the website or LinkedIn. Yeah. And what kind of walk us through the, the overview yeah. of a mantra session. What, if I'm coming to you and, yeah. and I say, yeah, I'll, I'll take you up on that. What's that going to look like for me? So typically it's in the context right now uh, because of what I've done with Fishbowl. It's context of interviewing. Mm-hmm. So I ask for, hey, give me your job description you're looking at and your resume. Uh, for, if it's not about that and it's just kind of in the realm of like, I'm looking for life coaching. Mm-hmm. What we do though with Viewpoint is from now on, this is just how we do this. If it's life coaching, if it's interview coaching, if it's whatever, we go through a mantra session because we want to know who you are to best serve you. Sure. And so every person who works with Viewpoint is going to go through a mantra session. A mantra session typically is sitting down with me and I ask those questions. I say, hey, what drives you? What's motivating you? And then we go back and forth. I, I give you, okay, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? And you go, I don't know. I like, I like this. I don't like that part. Yeah. And we try to boil it down into a statement that you can then ground stuff out of, ground yeah. around, right? So if it's the statement of I'm someone who, blank, 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 in that blank, 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 right? Now you can pull things to that. So if it's an interview, pull things from your resume to go one-to-one, right? And so say, this is who I am. And it makes me think of what I did. And now your resume is no longer uh, this experience of yours. It's actually just who you are lived out in this context. Uh, that's how a mantra session could look for like interviewing, but in general, like for a leader, I could say, this is who, this is what your mantra is. And this is how I think you le- you would probably lead best mm-hmm. as a result. Like this is how you could lead these people better. And then also if you start to get more of a puzzle, which I, I always liked doing puzzles when I was younger, you could say, okay, here are your people, here are their mantras. And you can kind of piece those together. But as typically a session would look like that. I sit down, ask you those questions. We kind of flush it out. And then I start to maybe get some more answers about like, what, what, are you, what are you doing in your life right now? And then I help make connections to those things. Yeah. And I, just as a, re- a reminder to our viewers, it, it's about taking a step. Yep. So if, if this is something that interests you, um, it's about taking a look at, at the services that we provide and, and just taking a step. You could feel overwhelmed by all the things that Joel's yeah. saying and, and that we're talking about. Uh, but at any given time, it comes down to just taking a step. Yeah. And even a small step is a step. So, Joel, thanks for joining us. Do really appreciate you, man. <laughs> we, could, we could shake hands on that. Thanks to our viewers, and we'll see you next time.